Hi everybody, welcome to week six and one more round of video fun with studying men and masculinities. So this is, I'm going to talk about chapter six in, in this book today and just a little tiny bit about chapter six in For Her Own Good. So, um, you know, let's just start with For Her Own Good. So this chapter is short, I think it's pretty easy, and it discusses the century of the child. So the thing that strikes me most about that is that in the United States, it seems to me that when women become mothers, they become, we, we're treated like infants. We're suddenly surrounded by small children. When we move from the adult world, you move from the adult world often, to, especially if you stay at home with your children, to a world of play groups and you know, mommy and me things, at least for the middle class, um, just a very uh, child-centered existence. And so Erin Reich in English will show us how this started in the century of the child, but it strikes me a lot today still. I think about this, how if you take your child to the pediatrician, you'll be called mom, um, how women are somehow um, lowered to the level of the children, in a sense, instead of moving on with our own lives and bringing our children with us, perhaps. So, in a way that, that men are not. So, anyway, Aaron Reich and English talk about the year of the child. Um, okay, so embodying masculinity is chapter six. And I thought this chapter was a little easier than the last one, but I'm still going to go through kind of the main concepts here. So, um, the first thing Buckbinder talks about are those kind of iconic bodies, and he looks back in Greek mythology for these, or Greek, ancient Greece, for these iconic bodies, and he finds them in Michelangelo, the statue of Michelangelo, and David. And so one body is the masculine ideal, really buff, you know, muscular, um, big takes up space, kind of the, what we think of stereotypically as masculine. And another one is waif-like, youthful, um, slim, a little uh, not quite developed into that masculine type. And then he, he mentions a third, which would be the big, kind of obese, beer belly, wise man, kind of the elder sage who eats and drinks too much and takes up space that way. And interestingly enough, as I was reading this, I thought about a fourth type, and Buckbinder mentions this fourth type later, which would be the grotesque. So at any rate, but think about this. When he talks about the kind of Michelangelo, the fit, muscular, athletic male body, and then the, the, the waif-like body, and then the big kind of, you know, older man who drinks too much rich body. It seems to me there's a third or a fourth, which is kind of the working class, beer drinking, fat husband married, who's kind of clueless, married to a beautiful woman. And we see this on TV in King of Queens. Um, I, you know, I can't even think of the shows that it, Roseanne, there's a little bit of that in Roseanne, but of course Roseanne was big too. But just this, if you think about the TV shows you see, it seems like there are kind of awkwardly looking and constructed men who are clueless, who nonetheless attract these amazing, beautiful women. So, um, but that category of man might go more into the grotesque, which Buckbinder talks about later. So, so he's got those categories of different ideals of masculinity. And while you're listening to this, just think about those ideals of masculinity. Do you see evidence of that? I mean, this stuff only matters if it operates in the real world. I mean, this is a really dense theory book, but he's describing patterns of behavior and ways of knowing the world that we should be able to recognize. So think about that. So then he talks about how man has been associated with the mind and women with the body in a way that means women are bodies, we are, we're embodied, we are body, as we know from this book and how doctors saw women as completely at the whim of the body. 
But a man can make his body. He can sculpt his body. A man is not quite his body. He has more control and mastery, which is important. And think about how much we value that control and mastery over the body in both men and women today. So I, I thought that was an important point to remember. Um, then he also talks about the the other body, the savage body or the black body, the not white. And black, it can be many categories. The not white body has some kind of otherness, but the black man in America takes on a significance that no other masculinity does. And he traces it back to um, a theorist who will tell us that the black male body has superior claims to masculinity because of its stereotypical strength and proneness. So in, on one hand, the black male body has superiority. It's got more masculinity. But on the other, that perhaps excess of masculinity brings the black body, black male body, closer to an animal. And so therefore denigrates the black male body. And I think we, every, we don't need to look very far to see evidence of how these things still operate today. I think about the ways in which some people talk about um, our African-American athletes and how we fear and view and treat black men. There was a study, um, I want to say long, long ago in the 1980s, an elevator study where they had a video camera in an elevator and had a nicely dressed African-American man walk in and out of an elevator all day and they filmed people's responses and people's responses were to shrink away. Women would pull their children in, women would pull their purse tighter. And I, I've, when I first heard of this study, I remember thinking, what dramatic negative psychological impact that subtle prejudice and disrespect and psychological abuse, what a toll that would take on the man, you know, who people feared. So the black male body is freighted with all kinds of things in, in our culture with our white dominant narrative. Um, then Buckbinder talks about the classic and the grotesque body, and this is on page 130. He's got a list of all these characteristics of the grotesque, um, natural individual, lacking control. And this is the grotesque body, the beer drinking, out of control, um, oh, undisciplined body, eats too much, scratches under the armpit, or whatever. You know, we can imagine this. So, um, um, and he does note that some of these characteristics are also um, attributed to the female body. So, then he has a section on the penis, because you have to have a section on the penis when you talk about masculinity. And kind of the uh, most important thing to take away from that is that the sense that the penis is and is really not part of the body. Um, it is and it is not. It has a life of its own. Um, it can stand up. It can do things on its own. And the man, the self, is not entirely in control of the penis. So the penis in some way almost isn't part of the man, of the male body. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting dynamic to think about because it also opens up, um, uh, ex I don't want to say excuses, a realm of narrative for why men do violent, ridiculous, stupid things if one has no control over their body. So uh, at any rate, that's the section on the penis. More interesting to me was the... Um, the end of the chapter when um, Buckbinder talks about disciplining the body. And I think about this a lot. And he, he talks about how, you know, these instructions for how to be masculine, how to act like a man, and he references some books and magazines about, what was that one from Australia? Building a Better Bloke. Um, but we, you know, when you think about this, 
instructions in masculinity and femininity and how we're supposed to discipline our bodies, they're, they abound. They're everywhere. For women, we, we know these instructions. We see these instructions in magazines and newspapers, um, pamphlets in doctor's offices, etc. Men see them too. How to be in control of your body bodybuilding, running, eating right, discipline, etc. Um, it, especially in the United States, it seems like we're always going to take ourselves in hand and build a better body and be healthier and be better. But this is all really about disciplining and regulating the body. I mean, who's telling us we need to do this? Um, I mean, we can't just say medicine tells us as if medicine and science is out there separate from the rest of the world because we know from Ehrenreich and English that medicine and science are also influenced by other ideas and ideals. So this idea of the disciplined body I find very um, central to life right now. I think that we're all very busy disciplining our bodies or berating ourselves for being unable to discipline our bodies and it's and you get a lot of kickback from people if you don't conform to these ideals of the disciplined regulated masculine or feminine body and the other thing I want to put put in here too he kind of touches on this with the temple is that we have we've kind of taken this concept of health and conflated concepts of beauty and masculinity and femininity into health so if you think purely in terms of health as if we, if we could go into a body and map the blood and the organs and just see how the functions are all working, aside from aesthetics and weight and natural glow or whatever you want to call it, we might be able to see what health looked like. But health as we know it today exists and supports our concepts of masculinity and femininity. I think that really isn't Buck Finder. So, okay, so I hope I summed that up. We have just one more video left, one more chapter in the book, I think, and I hope everybody has a good week. Thanks.